Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, I trust uh, all our participants are refreshed uh, from last evening. Uh, it's uh, my uh, great pleasure, uh, on behalf of Rusi, uh, General uh, Cernik, uh, and uh, the Army, uh, and indeed all the other nationalities represented uh, here, uh, to extend a very warm welcome uh, to our Secretary of State uh, for Defence, Sir Michael Fallon, to uh, this, our latest uh, Rusi Land Warfare uh, Conference. Uh, perhaps I can just start with a couple of housekeeping remarks and then uh, some wider introductory uh, comments. Uh, both the prepared remarks and the Q&A in this session will be on the record. Uh, additionally, we will be using Slido again and delegates can interact with the session throughout by logging onto that software and entering the code RUSI. LWC, uh, and uh, the Secretary of State uh, will be glad to take questions both through that mechanism and directly from the floor when you raise your hand when we uh, get onto that stage. I think politics, perhaps like warfare, is an unpredictable uh, and fluid business. Uh, the, uh, even when uh, victory appears in sight, uh, unforeseen events uh, occur, and the best laid plans rarely survive uh, contact uh, with uh, reality. The key to success is strategic clarity, but also combined with operational and tactical flexibility. And perhaps uh, that uh, guidance for our political leaders is nowhere truer than at the top of the Ministry of Defence. And I think it's a testament to Sir Michael's skills and capabilities, if I may say so, uh, as a political leader, uh, that uh, he has now almost completed his third year, I think, as Secretary of State uh, for Defence, uh, in a position which, from day one, uh, demands a remarkable range of skills and capabilities. It's worth reminding ourselves uh, what uh, we ask our political leaders in this and indeed in other areas to do. Unlike, I think, most of your NATO counterparts you'll be meeting uh, this week, uh, you have uh, responsibilities to a constituency. Uh, you have direct contact with members of the British public in your constituency on a very regular basis, and I think it's one of the strengths of our political system that you do. You lead a complex, and at times, I think, hard to manage, uh, a rather disparate uh, department uh, with all the distinct interests uh, and concerns that department has. But you also exercise political control of the complex military operations uh, in which the UK continues to be engaged most strongly at the moment, of course, the counter ISIL campaign. And you have a very important responsibility for sending clear deterrent messages when those are called for, as you have most recently in relation to possible future chemical weapon use uh, by the Assad regime uh, in, uh, in Syria. Uh, and it's quite a job description in any case, but perhaps particularly uh, at this moment. You've served as Secretary of State for three years. Uh, during that period, starting in the middle of 2014, you've overseen uh, the UK's response to the rapidly ch developing challenges we face from Russia, from the Wales summit uh, for NATO in 2014, now through to the deployment of UK forces alongside our French and Danish allies in Estonia. You've led the UK's military response to the evolving Daesh threat, uh, now apparently uh, in reaching a new stage in the end game, at least in relation to Mosul and Raqqa. And of course, you took over responsibility for the Ministry of Defence at a time when it faced steep cuts in budgets uh, and personnel. You played a key role in the 2015 Spending Review and uh, Strategic Defence and Security Review with, with its commitment, clear commitment to stop uh, and begin to reverse uh, those cuts. 
Uh, and you're very aware today, of course, with all the talk of new spending reviews and where we're going next, uh, of the importance of representing the defence in interests very strongly in that. The first day of our conference yesterday covered these themes and many more, and as you would expect, much of the focus was on specific issues relating uh, to land forces, how to reconfigure our land forces and those of our allies to deter and if necessary fight capable adversaries uh, posing challenges we've not seen since 1989, the increased importance of being ready to fight in an urban environment. Uh, one speaker, I think, uh, uh, compared what's happening in Mosul as we speak uh, to uh, the last stand of uh, the Germans in, in Berlin, uh, knowing that they were going to lose, but nevertheless determined to fight as hard as they can. And not least, we discussed how to mobilize the talents and the unique capabilities of new personnel in our armies uh, to achieve our objectives going forward. Uh, Secretary of State, uh, we are delighted that you're here and look forward to your remarks. Thank you. Uh, Malcolm, thank you and uh, good morning. Uh, and a pleasure to be back with you again at this uh, conference. You described, I think, politics as an unpredictable business. I have the strange record now of being appointed Defence Secretary four times in three years, um, which might perhaps uh, describe strong and stable leadership, but there you are. Today, as your conference theme reminds us, we live in an age of constant competition. But if we want to really understand what that phrase means, we need to take a step back. A hundred years ago, our main dangers came from rival nations threatening us with conventional war. The army was expected to play a pivotal role fighting at close range. It did so with unprecedented courage and amidst the mud and blood of battles, monumental battles such as Passchendaele that we will commemorate shortly. But the Cold War introduced another level of threat all over again, the shocking prospect of nuclear war. Our deterrent relied not just on nuclear submarines or NATO partnerships, but also we shouldn't forget on the physical presence of our troops ranging ever ready along the frontier of the Iron Curtain. Today, globalization and the relentless advance of technology pose our nations a very different set of problems. We have state aggressors like Russia testing our allies along Europe's eastern border using proxies to destabilize Ukraine and annex Crimea, deploying hybrid means to undermine democracies in countries far and wide. And then we have non-state actors, those lacking the power to threaten our nation as a whole, but intent on causing us as much carnage as possible as we've seen so recently in Westminster, in Manchester, in Lon at London Bridge and Finsbury Park. And then we have anonymous cyber foes, often sponsored by state or non-state entities, lurking behind a veil of encryption, targeting our national infrastructure, as we saw with the recent cyber strike on Parliament itself. But that isn't a cold war. That's a grey war, permanently teetering on the edge of outright hostility hovering around the threshold of what we would normally consider to be an act of war. What does all that mean now for land power? We still look to you here in this audience to seize and hold territory, to fight in close proximity with and among the population. Since our willingness to employ land power is critical to our deterrent, Yet the question is neither about how or when we respond 
with appropriate force, since we'll do so at a time in the manner of our choosing. Instead, the real question is how we retain enough room for maneuver as equipment costs escalate and the demands from a multitude of diverse, complex, and concurrent dangers grow. And my thesis today is that the only way our armies can properly prepare for the battlefields of tomorrow is by placing innovation and adaptability at their core. Now that will require investment. We've chosen in the United Kingdom to spend on bigger and bolder defense. We're increasing our budget year on year, 0.5% ahead of inflation. Last year it was 35 billion, this year we're spending 36 billion. Next year it'll be 37 billion. But having more money doesn't of course mean we can do everything we want. It will always be, has always been, a question of prioritization. Thanks to the delegated model, service chiefs now have the responsibility, they have the accountability and the authority to order their own budgets. And I know that the Army feels incentivized to review its processes and structures to keep finding more efficient and smarter and more productive ways of doing things so that in turn it can reinvest in new projects to keep us on the cutting edge. At the same time, the service chiefs know that delivering some programs will be contingent on making efficiency savings. And that helps us focus so that by the time we reach our annual budget cycle, we are concentrating not on the nice-to-haves, but having more money for the things that we need most. And thanks to those decisions, we now have a much clearer sense of the things that really matter. First, platforms. The history of land warfare is punctuated by moments of brilliance, instances where innovation and imagination changed the course of operations. When the longbow became the musket, became the machine gun, when the chariot gave way to the cavalryman, and then a century ago at Combray, that tank breached the Hindenburg line, triggering yet another revolution in warfare. So today, we're using our 178 billion pound equipment program as the catalyst for a further step change in capability as we introduce Ajax. Ajax is more than just a piece of armor. Ajax is an information age sensor able to hoover up data from the ground and air for miles around, capable of detecting the invisible signs of cyber disturbance, able to offer a more complete picture of an increasingly dispersed battle space while coordinating our response with the wider force. And Ajax isn't the only bit of capability we're bringing online. We are using that rising budget to invest in a whole raft of high-tech capability in unmanned aerial systems, autonomous vehicles, and Apache attack helicopters. Today, I'm announcing that we've awarded a 48 million pound six-year contract extension with Aviation Training International to enable our ground crews to master all there is to know about flying this mighty machine from avionics and armaments to rearming and refueling. In a couple of months' time, we'll be showcasing some of this next generation kit at DSCI. Now, these investments aren't just about replacing old kit. We are now buying equipment that gives us far more bang for our buck. In a data-driven era, investment in vehicles, of course, must go hand in hand with investment in networks. And that's why we're enormously increasing our processing power to handle the massive upload of new information. We've already taken the first steps. We're starting to invest in Morpheus, a next-generation tactical communication and 
information system that will give us faster and easier connectivity. In the longer term, our land environment, tactical command and information system will eventually connect all our sensors and systems. Now, a great kit alone doesn't guarantee an agile and adaptable army. So the second major investment has to be in people. And perhaps you will allow me to say at this point that all our thoughts and prayers are with the families and friends of Corporals Matthew Hatfield and Darren Nielsen of the Royal Tank Regiment, who died so tragically after a live firing exercise in Castle Martin. And our thoughts also go out to the other two soldiers who were injured in that deeply sad incident. There's an investigation ongoing and we will get to the bottom of what happened. And we have to, because our people are our greatest asset. And that is why we remain committed to maintaining the overall size of the armed forces and an army that is capable of fielding a war fighting division whilst we also support planned increases in the size of the Royal Navy and the Royal Air Force. Mass will always be a vital part of deterrence. So we will continue to maintain an army that remains one of the very few capable in the world of fielding that war-fighting division. And when it comes to reserves, our confidence in our reserves plans is reflected by the fact that the Infrastructure and Projects Authority has recently taken the Army Reserves program off its books, the only program to be so assured in the last five years. But in a more competitive labor marketplace, it becomes even harder to retain, to retrain, and to recruit the right people with the right mix of skills. So let me just say a word on each of those. On retention, our flexible engagement reforms championed by Senec Carter are key. Our new legislation on those reforms will be published tomorrow. We're going to make it easier for personnel to change the nature of their service, to give them the chance to work part-time or be temporarily protected from deployment to support their personal circumstances where operational need allows. That's retention. On training, the battle for information and influence will increasingly matter, so our soldiers will need to have a raft of new skills to become more adept at crunching the data that's churned out by their new equipment, to become more aware of what that information means, to become more able to make swifter, better informed decisions. We will need to increase our training in counter-reconnaissance because the information environment is far from being a passive space. It's now a hotly contested battleground where we're constantly competing to correct the false narrative of our adversaries with the faster truth. For that to happen, the Army will need to keep adapting its structures starting today. I am also announcing that we are bringing the Royal Signals and Intelligence Corps together under a shared command. The Intelligence Corps, of course, packages, collates and analyzes vital information on the battlefield. The Royal Corps of Signals provides the state-of-the-art technology to disseminate information quickly in an agile way. Working together, those two cores will, begin, will bring a laser-like focus and coordination to our cyber efforts. That's retention and retraining. So finally to recruitment. There's a challenge here and a challenge I want to set before this conference. We know we will need to reach out to the brilliant brains of tomorrow. People who at the moment put apps ahead of artillery, who prize brains over bayonets. We know we have to maintain the army as an attractive proposition for those who might not have immediately considered 
choosing a military career. The cyber geeks, the tech wizards. The question is how do we attract that element in the new generation? Let me offer a few initial thoughts to frame your discussions. We need to do more with our reservists, more with our whole force of civilians and industrialists, so they, because they bring a fresh injection of new ideas and new approaches and outside expertise. Second, we must be open post Chilcot to challenge from the younger generation. Of course, the army as an institution has to revere its great traditions. But when younger people tell us that there are savvier ways for us to communicate, then I think we have to listen. And I'm glad that in earlier sessions, we've laid down a, a marker here in the invitation that you extended to junior delegates to come up and show us a thing or two. My final point is that an agile army of the future requires strong partnerships sharing the burden of complex global challenges. Our SDSR 2015 set us the challenge of becoming more international by design. So as we step back from the political framework of the European Union, you will find us sticking by that plan and stepping up to confront those global challenges. That's why we will strengthen our commitment to NATO, the cornerstone of our defense. By increasing our budget year on year, we're not just about fielding a division, but more able to put our troops at the service of the Alliance. Currently, the Army heads up NATO's very high readiness joint task force. A couple of weeks ago, I saw in Romania troops from the 1st Battalion, Princess of Wales, Royal Regiment partnering with 14 other nations in exercise Noble Jump. At the same time, our troops are leading enhanced forward presence in Estonia and in Poland. By the end of this month, we'll have 10,000 soldiers supporting the NATO alliance in one way or another. Yet our efforts here show how we're getting smarter as we adapt to the new era of competition. We're not just using training and exercising to get our people in shape, but to deliver strategic effects, messages of reassurance to our allies, messages of deterrence to our adversaries. But if we want to be really smart, we have to be able to spot a crisis before it turns into a catastrophe, or better still, before it even arises. And that's why we're creating those specialized infantry teams invested with specialist skills relevant to different parts of the globe, there to sense danger, to provide early warning, to build the partnerships that head off trouble further down the track. And for proof of our commitment to keep reaching out, you need only look around this room this morning. This might be a UK land warfare conference, but we have here a huge number of guests drawn from our allies all around the world, and you are very welcome. So platforms, people, and partnerships are the key to an agile edge, the agile edge we need in this era of constant competition. But we also need to take the public with us on this journey. Since the end of our Afghanistan and Iraq fighting campaigns, the public no longer have the same level of awareness of what our armies are up to. And as the threats become ever grayer and murkier, as our responses necessarily become sometimes more <coughs> opaque, as our adversaries become ever more effective at using misinformation to play upon public fears, it is all the more incumbent on us to shine the light of transparency on this new grayer dawn, reassuring our people that we're on the case, 
showing them that we do have the means to respond, that there is sim not simply a cost, but a real value to what we do. And that is why the public discourse, why open debate, why conferences such as these are so vital. So let me say, Malcolm, in conclusion, a century ago, as after years of stalemate, that Mark IV tank burst through the Hindenburg Line, an event that wouldn't just lead to the Allied armies winning that war, but to war itself being transformed. So today, we live in an age of instability, an age of constant competition. But the answer is for our armies to keep adapting and keep becoming truly agile. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, Secretary of State, thank you very much indeed for those very clear uh, uh, remarks. Uh, we now have until 9.45 uh, for Q&A, uh, and at that stage the Secretary of State uh, does have to leave for another engagement. Uh, we've had, I think, 28 questions already uh, through Slido, uh, but we're not going to get through uh, any of those. But uh, perhaps I could uh, start with... Uh, we'll try. Uh, 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 perhaps I can start uh, with one question from an anonymous uh, questioner uh, who asked, uh, with two carriers at three billion pounds each and F-35B aircraft at 135 million, is there enough money left for land maneuver? Yes. <laughs> well, at this rate, we might get through all the questions. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, the, you know, the carriers were built into the budget, so were the F-35s to uh, fly off them, but the Army budget increases as well. Very good. Uh, sec the second question, one of the more popular questions from the audience, uh, was a question uh, from Deborah Haynes in relation to uh, the numerical commitment on the Army. Perhaps if, if Deborah is here, I'm sure she is. Deborah? Deborah, can you stand up and ask your question? No, uh, yeah, please. Is there a mic microphone? Thank you. Uh, good morning. <laughs> um, the Tory manifesto no longer has a commitment to maintaining an army of 82,000. Um, could you give that guarantee here today, please? Um, and, um, and secondly, is MIV going to come onto contract in the next couple of years, please? Thank you, Deborah. MIV. Uh, medium in infantry vehicle. So I didn't hear the second bit. Was it MIV? Well, what about MIV? De Deborah, can you just clarify the second part of your question? Yeah, I just wanted to know: Is MIV actually going to come under contract in the next couple of years, as right. planned? Well, on the first, you know, our manifesto was very clear: we're going to maintain the size of our armed forces. We're already committed to increasing the size of the Navy and increasing the size of the um, uh, Royal Air Force. There aren't going to be any reductions in the size of the Army, but we're going to maintain the uh, ability to fight at, uh, at a, uh, uh, as we've said, at a war fighting, uh, to be able to maintain a war fighting uh, division, as I made clear in my speech. MIV, yes, I hope to get on contract within the next couple of years, yeah. Very good, thank you. Uh, the next question, again, an anonymous question, uh, is, uh, is this, contemplating a resurgent Russia, does the decision to withdraw considerable numbers of British Army personnel and headquarters from Germany remain a prudent decision? Uh, yes, I think it does. Um, it's not um, something uh, we're, we're revisiting. Of course, um, it was a decision taken before uh, NATO committed to enhanced uh, forward presence. And um, you know, it comes at a time when we continually look at where is the best place to train and to, to exercise with our allies. So these are, um, you know, these are things we, we continue to uh, look at. But we're not uh, reversing the decision to withdraw the army from uh, the Rhine. 
Is this on this particular issue? No. no. It is. Harland, please. Uh, can we have the microphone at the front? Good morning, Secretary of State. Thank you for your comments. Uh, I'm Harlan Ullman. My question is about Russia and your own views. Uh, Russia has several advantages over the West, in my judgment. The first is a numerical superiority in theater nuclear weapons, about which we seem not to discuss very much publicly. You will know that your opposite number in Moscow just threatened the other day to increase the number of nuclear weapons in Kaliningrad. And second, Russian active measures, and it seems to me one of the areas where NATO has been derelict is not pursuing a strategy to take on active measures. And so I'm wondering what your thoughts are about how we deal with this nuclear imbalance vis-a-vis -vis Russia, and what do we do in putting together a more cogent strategy to deal with their active measures? Very good. Right, well, on, on the first, you know, we have to keep up our um, nuclear uh, uh, defenses, in, in particular our nuclear deterrent, and we'll be, um, uh, I will be updating our NATO allies on that uh, tomorrow at the session on, uh, on nuclear uh, planning. Uh, it's very important we continue to uh, do that and uh, to resist some of the uh, uh, some of the some of the attempts by uh, other countries to uh, uh, to get us to uh, disarm. So we must keep up our nuclear deterrent. What was the second question on active, active measures? Hybrid warfare. On hybrid warfare. Well. Yeah. Yeah. No, and uh, you know we continue to to urge NATO to um, uh, to get more involved in uh, in countering uh, hybrid uh, warfare. Um, I've um, announced yesterday that we were putting our own. Uh, we're ready to put our own uh, 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 cyber capabilities at the service of NATO, including offensive cyber capability. Uh, that we'll be the first to offer that. Um, but we do need, uh, NATO does need to do that. It needs to coordinate its strategic communications and uh, to uh, work more effectively at that. And uh, I set out in some detail what we need to do in a speech I gave yesterday at the Cybersecurity uh, Conference, and we can get you a copy. Now, can we have some questions from the floor? Would anybody else like to ask a question from the floor? Uh, gentlemen, here, please. Uh, James Carl Smith, I'm the British military attaché in Washington. I wonder if I can be cheeky and ask two questions, uh, Secretary of State. The first is you talked about platforms, people and partnership, and then you introduced a fourth P, the public. Uh, it's not new, but a fifth P, politicians. Do you feel that your um, fellow politicians uh, understand the armed forces as much as perhaps they should? The second question is you'll be aware that the Trump administration has recently not so much delegated, but um, given a few more powers down to the Pentagon. Uh, is there anything that we can learn from that? Secretary of State. Well, on the, on the first, um, you know, I think um, Parliament itself is beginning to change, and we're seeing refreshingly, I think, on both sides of the House, uh, more uh, younger members who've served, uh, who've had the privilege of serving, which I didn't have, but who've served in Iraq and Afghanistan. now coming into politics and adding to the, the knowledge that the House has of these matters from both sides of the House. And I think that's an extremely important development. When I first entered the House in the early 80s, there were, of course, a number of members who'd fought in the Second World War. Um, and we're now seeing a new generation of politicians who, who have served, and I have uh, two of my five ministers who, who've, who've put on uniform, which I think you know, is, is one of the keys uh, to this, but we need to keep. We need to continue to work uh, to work harder at it. I actually think the public are ahead of us in this. I think you know the public uh, uh, well understand that we have to keep up our defences. Um, the pub it was the public support, I think, implicit support, that you know kept politicians up to the the two percent, um, and I think would make it very difficult for any political party actually now to get off that uh, two percent commitment. On delegation. Um, you know, you'll know better than anybody that um, uh, the system in the United States is, uh, you know, is very federalized. Uh, there are different sources of uh, power and authority and so on. Right? So I don't think there's a direct model for us. 
I think it is important through the uh, National Security um, um, uh, Council and the committee and the uh, cabinet that there is direct accountability. I'm not sure I would want or should have the power to um, uh, set uh, deployment levels or, or authorize new deployments entirely on my own. I think it's important that you know, these are decisions for the government as a whole and that I'm properly accountable for them. Mm, very good. Please. Good morning. Um, this may be a little unfair on you, but as Defence Secretary... Could you introduce you, yourself, please? My name is Isabel Oakeshott. Uh, as Defence Secretary, there is some impression that you are simply managing decline. Uh, I'm interested in how robustly you are resisting demands from the Treasury for further cuts. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, we're not cutting the budget. The budget is increasing, as, I, as I, th I think I said. It was 35 billion last year, it's 36 billion this year, 37 billion next year. It's going up each year of this parliament, not only to meet the 2%, but it has an inbuilt uh, increase of 0.5% ahead of inflation. So we're not managing decline. On the contrary, we're managing growth. And we've set out an equipment program of 178 billion over 10 years, which is the biggest investment program ever, ever in the history of this country, which includes the aircraft carriers, includes new frigates, includes uh, Ajax, includes F-35, includes uh, nine P-8 maritime patrol aircraft. So this is a period of, uh, of growth, not decline. Professor Clark. Uh, Secretary of State, Michael Clark, yeah. uh, Senior Associate Fellow of the Institute. I just wanted to come back to this question of army numbers and, and Deborah Haynes's question. Because in 2015, um, you said at RUSI that the number would be 82,000 and wouldn't fall below that. And the last time I saw a current number, it was 78,400. And you said on the Andrew Marr program that 82,000 was a number you were moving towards. So we'd already fallen below the, the, the floor that had been set. And when you say now that you're going to maintain army numbers, just to be clear, are you saying that the 78,400 is the number below which you will not fall? Is that the new floor, not age 2,000 now, but 78,400? Or is the aspiration still to get back to 82,000 and make that the new floor? I think the Army deserves a, a, as clear an answer as you're able to give to what is the base number that you expect the Army to be? Well, I, you know, we've not, we don't set a, a floor. I've made it clear that we're going to maintain the size of the armed forces in total, um, but there is already an increase coming in the size of the Navy and in the size of the Air Force. The Army is below 82,000, and we're giving the Army, you know, the, um, the Army has money to uh, uh, resource now and, and a lot of effort going into recruitment to keep that number coming up. But uh, overall, the commitment is very clear in the manifesto. We're maintaining the size of our armed forces. There are not going to be reductions. And we're increasing the size of the Navy and the Air Force. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Robert from Rusi. Uh, Secretary of State, um, it's been some time since the Iraq inquiry came out. You've directed uh, some work to uh, examine some of those outputs, uh, but we've yet to see much coming out. Could you give us you know, some broad headlines about what uh, Dr. Hutton and his team have discovered from the Chilcot report and how you're going to take that work further um, to benefit the armed forces uh, and perhaps the political establishment? Yeah, well, we're not, uh, it's not just us, obviously. The Chilcot report was, were, you know, were lessons for the military, but also lessons for uh, the politicians, for Whitehall more generally. So it's not simply our department. It's a little too early to, to report back directly. There is obviously work in hand inside the military itself. And I think um, uh, Nick Carter has been you know, ahead of the field here in, in, uh, in uh, discussing openly how challenge can be reconciled with a hierar the hierarchical system that is the army. Um, that's important, but there is also work going on inside, uh, inside our ministry as to how um, uh, we avoid some of the uh, dangers of, of groupthink and, and, uh, and so on in the formulation of policy. And I think it's a little too early to report back on that, but we will certainly be doing that. <clears throat> right, other questions from the floor. I have one uh, extra question from, from the iPad as well. Please, this gentleman right here.
Thank you. Monty Dinverna from the International Institute for Strategic Studies. Uh, just a quick point of clarification on the uh, mechanized infantry vehicle, which was uh, a question was already asked about that. Um, that's been uh, mentioned previously as being a key part of the new uh, strike brigades. Uh, is there any change to the plan uh, to procure that vehicle going forward um, uh, from what has previously uh, been mentioned in the uh, SDSR? Thank you. Uh, no, there isn't. Very good. Very clear. Uh, the lady here. And perhaps while we're waiting for that, we'll, we'll park that and have one other, que an anonymous question, which is, will the rise in the defense budget include a rise in wages held at 1% at present, which is lower than inflation and lower than tax rises? Well, that's... Um that is uh, obviously a huge question. It's partly um, a matter for the pay review bodies, um, but it is also, you know, it involves a forecast of where you expect inflation to be. Um, you know, I think we expect inflation to start falling back again uh, from the autumn onwards, but it is obviously something we have to consider not just uh, for the army, but right across the public sector as a whole. Thank you. Two. Lady here. Sir, Sarah Mackman, currently working for the Army Director of Capability down at Andover. Under the delegated model, how do you see the centre contributing towards that flexible, agile and adaptable decision making that we would wish to see from our Chiefs of Staff um, if they're fully empowered under the delegated model? Does, is the centre um, yet agile enough to support that? Well, I hope so. Um, you know, it's obviously a consequence of the delegated model that um, the centre perhaps has become a little thinner than it was in terms of contributing to uh, policy formation. And we do need to keep looking at that, uh, at that balance um, between uh, the centre and the, and, the, uh, and the top uh, and the TLCs. And, um, you know, it may be that, um, you know, we have to look again and see whether the centre needs uh, any reinforcement. It is still relatively early days in the, in the history of this delegation, um, and it obviously, you know, the, it, it, um, there is the manage management of delegated budgets, but also, you know, the operational decisions as well, and we do need to see whether that balance is absolutely right. So I can't give you a, a perfect answer on that, um, but, uh, you know, it is something we keep, uh, we keep reviewing, and we've had the advice of, uh, fortunately, the advice of Lord Levine, each uh, successive year, he's been reviewing, I think three years running, he's been reviewing the, um, that balance as to how the delegated model is, is working, and it's something we will keep on reviewing. Right, and we're now running out of time, I'm afraid, but one last question from Professor Cornish. Malcolm, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Paul Cornish, an associate fellow of the Institute. I was actually going to say, Malcolm, how unf unfair I thought it, it was that you were asking some people to stand up and give their name. Uh, when they're asking questions, but you didn't ask the same of Anonymous, who has got away with it, obviously. Um, <laughs> that, that worked. Um, my, my, it's going back to the numbers, if I may, Secretary of State. You, we, we're talking about a defence budget that's capped at 2% of, let's face it, a, a fairly um, sluggish GDP. Uh, we're talking about spending that's 0.5% above inflation, which is, um, as you just said, I think, uh, look, looking to go down by the end of the year. Um, how confident are you that this level of growth, as you put it, is sufficient to keep ahead of defence inflation, for example? In other words, is there actually still, behind all these numbers, the risk that defence spending in the UK might, <coughs> excuse me, might be flatlining? Well, it isn't flatlining. It's going up. It's going up ahead of inflation. It's going up in real terms. It's going up in each year. That's the, that's the purpose of the 0.5%. And if you look carefully at our manifesto, you will see that uh, we are committed to increasing the budget by at least 0.5%, uh, two rather significant words. Um, so we are going to keep inflation ahead of inflation, and we need to keep ahead of inflation. At the same time, of course, we have new uh, leverage to ensure that uh, uh, some defence costs are kept properly under control through the SSRO, uh, and the negotiations we're having with our, you know, contractors as the equipment program, you know, gets, uh, gets fully underway to ensure that uh, we do uh, keep a grip of, uh, of uh, 
cost inflation in the defense industries. We're able to do that now because of the, ref the ability to refer to the SSRO and uh, because um, DNS uh, you know, it can, is, is able now to take a more robust line in some of these negotiations. This is an increasing budget. Many of my colleagues around the cabinet table are presiding over declining budgets. They're reducing their services. They're reducing their outputs. They're continuing to reduce their numbers. We're not. Defense is growing. We are growing the number of people in defense. We're increasing the Navy and the, and the Air Force. We are committed to, to new equipment. You saw the carrier sail under the fourth bridge on, on Monday, 3.2 billion pounds. And we've got a second one uh, coming, coming shortly. We are investing in defense. Can I conclude this session by, ask, uh, by uh, thanking uh, all our excellent uh, questioners uh, for putting those issues on the table and to the Secretary of State for the very clear uh, way in which he answered uh, all those questions. So uh, please uh, join me in thanking the Secretary of State.